Rot Eaters, Descendants of the Bone Crushers The Bone Crushers figured out how to artificially ferment flesh, avoiding mass starvation. Their civilization continued to advance, and inevitably their bodies began to adapt to its environment. With their food being partly processed for them, their powerful beaks shrunk, and the decline of inter- and in-group violence over sustenance caused their bodies to become more and more gracile as well. Eventually, civilized bone crushers grew so different from their feral ancestors that they could be considered a new species, rot eaters. The only thing that reminded of their scavenging past was their excellent sense of smell, as important to their culture as sight and hearing. Their sweat glands played as much of a role in interpersonal communication as their vocal cords, and individuals, classes and races were distinguished primarily by how they smelled, not how they looked or acted. And yes, they still showed their affection by defecating on each other, though the practice became more tame and formal over time. Depicted as one of the race's most renowned scientists. The body and its excretions are not a taboo in his culture, so, like other rot eaters, he only wears clothes when it's cold outside. Clickers, descendants of the blind folk. A random earthquake connected one of the blind folk's caves to the surface, allowing a small population to escape before their cave system collapsed. The species couldn't evolve sight again, so they still had to rely on their echolocation ability. Unable to compete with sighted predators during the day, they stayed awake at the world's moonless nights, but even then they needed to perfect their strengths in order to survive. Their whole faces got twisted into structures resembling satellite dishes. Their ears migrated to the place once occupied by eyes, and merged with ultrasonic, cool-producing structures derived from their noses, forming a grotesque flesh lotus. This face sonar proved so precise that clickers could literally see forms and even textures in the reflected sounds. With this ersatz sight, the blind folk's descendants became the world's best nocturnal predators, and the need to process all the complex signals from the sonars boosted the evolution of their brains. Inevitably, one species from this lineage made it to sentience. Huge cities, designed with great attention to acoustics and decorated with sculptures and bas-reliefs, sprawled all over the planet. Though most of the clicker activities took place during the night, one couldn't appreciate this much of civilization from space. None of the streets were illuminated by a single lamp. Still a bit agoraphobic, having kept to thickets even on the surface, the race preferred tight spaces, so there were rarely any streets to speak about at all. To Homo sapiens, their cities would resemble the insides of Kowloon Walled City, except clean and intersected with Vactrain tubes. And pitch black, of course. No sight of blue sky, sun or Milky Way meant anything to them. Everything above the horizon looked just like a vast void to their sonars, and that, understandably, made them uncomfortable. The clickers didn't even know other stars existed before they received signals from their post-human cousins. Depicted as a clicker engineer trying to fix some wires. Note the reduced whiskers, useless in the race's new spacious environment, and the elongated antennae-like fingers specialised on touch. Puppeteers, descendants of the Temptors. The comet missed the Temptor's planet, and these abominations continued to evolve. The mindless male drones began to specialise on different tasks, splitting into several anatomically differing castes, the affiliation to each determined by their mother's hormonal balances during gestation. The means of controlling crowds of these workers and soldiers grew more and more intricate, until they were guided almost as directly as radio-controlled toy cars. The anthill-like colonies formed by these creatures spread all over the planet, viciously competing with each other and spurring the evolution of intelligence. Soon females from one lineage learned to make their servitors create fire and farm crops, and everything went smoothly from there. 
The puppeteer civilization consisted, in a sense, solely of feudal lords. Sessile females owned territories around their homes and cultivated those using swarms of remotely controlled male workers. In the earlier stages of history, using systems of tubes transporting pheromones and mechanical dummies, imitating signalling movements, and in later years, by brain-to-brain -brain neural interfaces. A matrilineal clan was the most common political entity in this world, and the healthiest men were often used as currency in international trade. The race progressed quickly, but it quickly met the problem of overpopulation. While there was only a couple thousand queens in the biggest puppeteer city, there were millions upon millions of males, who all had to be fed and sheltered somehow. There was a split between progressives who decided to replace all men with machines, and conservatives who saw them as extensions of their bodies and considered this innovation a transhumanist perversion. The sides went to war with each other, and the transhumanists won by using a genetic weapon that rendered the enemy queens sterile. After that, most of the males were disposed of, read slaughtered, with only a fraction left alive as queens, personal servants and pets. Despite the cruelty, this saved the world from demographic collapse and allowed for the creation of post-scarcity society. Only then could the puppeteers finally afford to explore space and meet their distant post-human cousins. Pictured are two males of different castes belonging to a pre-automation enthusiast. Both are heavily modified for their jobs with genetic engineering and mechanical augmentation, and controlled directly by the Queen's brain. The towers seen in the background are the residences of their Queen's relatives, each populated by just one female and a couple hundred servants, mechanical and organic alike. Grazers, descendants of the Titans. Through random mutation, a small subset of Titans acquired a thick coat of fur and was able to survive the Ice Age, though losing their proto civilization. After the glaciers retreated, the rising sea levels split the species into two separate lineages. One population found itself stranded on an island with limited resources and shrunk in size, becoming a separate species from the mainland population. When the land masses connected through a land bridge once again, now vastly different titans and grazers had to compete. Greatly reduced in size, vulnerable to predators and with halved lifespans, the dwarf freaks would seem to be inferior to their larger cousins. In a sense, they were, but this very inferiority allowed for their biggest strength, intelligence, to actually become useful and be selected for once again. The pre-Ice Age Titan civilization was more of a fluke, confined to a small territory and largely unnecessary for survival. Titans were so large and so social, no predator would dare to attack even the youngest of their herd, and few natural elements meant anything but irritation to them. Thus, there was actually little need for progress, and the civilization they had initially developed brought little substantial advantage over feral populations, who constituted the overwhelming majority of the race, even during its technological peak. After the Ice Age undid all the progress, no woolly titans ever discovered civilization again, being able to satisfy all their needs with giant muscles and nothing more. Grazers had it different. Having traded the safety of gigantism for more compact bodies that required less food, they made themselves vulnerable, and thus acquired the stimulus for innovation. Shelters and weapons, bigger, more stable and more complex societies. Unlike Titans, they actually needed all this to survive. Shorter lives also meant that Grazer's generations occurred faster, which made their evolution more rapid. After a million years or so, they surpassed the Neanderthal-like intellect of their ancestors and built an expansionist civilization that displaced their giant barbaric cousins and eventually drove them to extinction. The new race was approximately the size of a cow, and much more gracile in proportions than their ancestors. The lip trunk attached to a wide, powerful jaw has divided into two versatile hands, not unlike the tongues of the sail people. 
Having descended from grazing herbivores, they built a very hierarchical collectivist society with absolutist monarchy and dictatorship as the only recognised forms of government. In a true herd fashion, relatively few dominant males owned the majority of the race's females, with most other men having to either become their pen lovers, or gain favour with a harem owner, and receive a permission to spend a night with one of his wives. The other legal alternative was homosexuality, considered completely normal in most cultures. Kings usually had the most children in their countries, and because of that, the crown was rarely hereditary. This way, there'd be too many heirs to the throne. Lastly, for harmless grass-eaters, grazers were surprisingly violent, since the absence of any natural weaponry, like teeth or claws, caused them to never evolve restraints for in-group aggression. No ritualistic fights or concept of honour existed in their cultures. Graces fought not to wound, but to kill. Pictured as one of the race's most beautiful women, posing nude on a beach. With most attractive females locked in harems, the demand for erotic photography like this is extremely high among common male grazer population. Stickmen, descendants of the Striders. A random mutation occurred in one of the Strider populations, drastically expanding their ability to change skin colour. When the avian predators arrived, these Striders learned to use it for camouflage, blending in with the tree branches that they hid among. Over the following millions of years, they fully switched to arboreal lifestyles, and developed several adaptions to survive under the chicken yoke, such as leaf-like outgrowths all over the body, and controllable wrinkling of the skin to imitate tree bark. Their bodies lightened by shrinking in size, but also became sturdier in order to survive jumps from one tree to another. Since the sound faded quickly in the thin atmosphere of their low-gravity world, at long distances they communicated visually, by rapidly changing the colour and position of the leaf growths on their heads and long, twig-like fingers. At close distances, they spoke with long, deep hoots, resembling the sound of the wind, and expressed their emotions by changing skin texture. The need to navigate their complex three-dimensional environment quickly spurred the re-emergence of intelligence, and soon sentient, stick-bug-like stickmen drove the bird predators out of the forests. Gentle and fragile as they were, stickmen developed a culture emphasising calmness, patience and prudence. Evolved from creatures that had to stay motionless for extended periods of time, they disliked conflict and bustle, preferring quiet activities that demanded a great deal of concentration. Philosophies and spiritual teachings they produced rivalled those of Pterosapiens in depth and complexity, but were diametrically opposite in their message. Because trees reminded stickmen of themselves, their cultures were deeply ecologically minded, Many religions claimed that people reincarnated as trees after death, and so destroying one was often considered murder. The existence of forests was essential to pre-industrial cultures, since they built their cities right in the tree crowns, and needed to ensure their survival, but even later, mechanised civilizations retained a respectful attitude towards nature, trying to fit their towering, skinny buildings inside the natural environment, instead of replacing it with them. Because of that, stickmen also didn't rush to colonise other worlds when the time had come. It was better to stay at home, they figured, than to strand yourself in a place you didn't belong, destroying it in the process. Pictured as a stick man resting on top of a tree. Since his ancestors needed to stay motionless for long periods of time to remain undetected, he is able to enter a kind of cataleptic state, sitting completely motionless for hours on end. Many of his world's vacation spots would seem plain creepy to the modern human, being completely silent and filled with surreal people, still as statues. Processors, descendants of the Mantelopes. After the queue left, a marginal group of spacers dared to explore one of their abandoned star systems. 
There they found a horribly twisted world populated by the insectoids' morbid creations of which one species seemed to retain some semblance of sentience. Those were the mantelopes, and their existence was miserable. Having bred them for the purpose of recording information, the Q made mantelopes extremely curious, eager to fit as much knowledge into their brains as humanly possible. The species retained this need after the Q left, but, stuck in a far simpler environment than intended by their creators, were tormented by intense mental hunger, understandable only to the species designed for mental labour. The only way they could partially sate it was by retelling the old stuff, so they endlessly passed on strings of genetic code, entries from old trade reports, strange lyrics of chirping Q songs, anything they remembered from generation to generation. As the stories began to lose details over millennia, depressing philosophical and religious commentary started being added, expressing the race's shared frustration, sometimes even describing the Q reign as the Golden Age, the times of brain satiety. Being a species from a completely different background, spacers didn't really empathise with them. But Mantelope's excessively detailed folklore, preserved by the race's desperate need to remember something, caught their attention. It could come in really handy in researching the Q legacy and technology. Not out of pity, but of practical benefit, spacers intervened. They began to trade with Mantelope herds, offering protection from predators and elements in exchange for stories about the Q and their machines. They became the planet's gods, residing in heavens and patronising their chosen peoples via remotely controlled robot guards, in return collecting tributes of detailed accounts of this world's past. The planet became dotted with shrines built by the machines, where herds of mantelopes entered to tell tales and sing songs about the times long gone. The most intellectual and curious ones were granted the opportunity to stay to become their god's servants, helping to reconstruct the past from other herd stories and decipher the principles behind some of the Q technologies. This worked. The hints from the race's detailed tales helped to fill a lot of gaps in the data, sometimes salvaging entire research topics cornered by the lack of preserved material evidence, and accelerated reverse engineering of many useful artefacts. In the process, the gods quickly noticed how well the natives memorised every bit of trivia they told them. This made it clear that it was their inhumanly capricious brains, not some shared genetic memory, that were responsible for such unnaturally preserved folklore. Some excelling individuals were invited aboard the Space Ark to test the race's capacity for memory retaining, exceeding their gods' every expectation. So, when the well of ancient mantelope knowledge finally started to empty out, spacers quickly found a new role for the race, the one that it has been created for and made to crave like any other biological need, recording and storing information. What started as a simple trading agreement gradually became a tight symbiosis. The memory shrines grew in population and turned into giant automated cities, where millions of mantelopes worked as regenerating, bug-prone computers, recording and storing every contract or scientific article that their orbital partners deemed important, in return being nursed by machines 24-7. The planet's star system became the prime information hub and the unofficial capital of the Spacer Empire, and communities of mantelopes spread all across the galaxy aboard their master's asteroid arcs. After tens of millions of years of such close cohabitation, the species fully adapted to their role in the symbiosis. Their brains expanded drastically, in some breeds taking up more than two-thirds of the body weight, while the bodies, no longer necessary in a wholly artificial environment, atrophied, becoming immobile and fusing with their life-supporting cradles, much like female puppeteers. Their world, by then a full-blown ecumenopolis, accommodated trillions of such sessile citizens, each spending their life rooted to a small yet fully equipped pod room, with their minds lost in the expanses of both species' joint infosphere. 
Large sections of the interstellar asteroid arcs were made into sprawling networks of honeycomb-like nests, housing even bigger brained breeds, modified for the zero-g environment and catered to by their former gods themselves. Finally, the whole race was connected to a telepathic network via neural technology, becoming essentially a biological supercomputer capable of performing the craziest calculations, storing exabytes of information, and even simulating Matrix-style dream worlds for astromorphs to connect to. These biological thinking machines, no longer resembling a man or an antelope, came to be known as processors. And with their symbiotes, they absolutely dominated the galaxy. Depicted is a space arc processor being carried from one information storage facility to another by two alternate astromorphs. With such powerful mental machines to rely on, the individual astromorphs' brains are not as big and complex in this timeline, but their civilization, contrarily, is much more advanced. Other differences in their anatomy, such as extant toes and more hair, are due to the butterfly effect. <laughs>